you bringing that point up. And Daryl, I think that's the issue. The way we've coached all our lives and the way kids are coached today is beginning to change. And so Daryl, I just wonder if you've got any comments on what's been said so far and anybody else, please hold your hand up and well, let me just take it back a step. So the purpose of the whole thing, it was to illustrate, um, was to create an illustrative with a question, which is what I often do in, in the context of this membership that we have going on. We have a community of people. They're all, most of them are coaches. They coach at all different levels. So I feel a sense of responsibility to offer situations like this and I often use Ella as my guinea pig uh, to show or illustrate different things and then pose a question so in this context the the backstory on it is if you had a kid doing that and that's one single game so it's one game of 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 her playing what would you how would you coach her what would you say? And if we're going to use terms like cheating, which have no positive frame of mind, and particularly when you're speaking with girls, I find that that particular word is even more of a, of a bad word for them. It, it creates a lot of negative connotations to it. There's really no positive way of spinning in any way. So if you were to pull her aside and say, hey, like, what are you trying to do here? Feel like you're cheating for offense. She's not listening anymore. As soon as you say cheat, she's now internalizing the idea that she's cheating the game in some way, cheating her teammates in some way, doing something wrong. So that immediately is going to put her in a more of a turtle shell and is that really what your objective is? Is your objective to, to stunt or to diminish or to reduce these reads? Right now, Ella plays pretty free flowing. She's reading the game. She's, she's reacting based on exactly what you're talking about, Kim, a set of principles. These are principles in which she is she's adhering to and she does it the same way throughout the entire game because there's really no need for too much in the way of con considerations. So what I posed to the group was if you were going to coach her and we could all agree that using terminology like cheating, which you could say even in the NHL, I don't even know how much cheating is like really going on there. I don't know how many players are really like actively cheating the game and, you know, actively just disregarding to be on the offensive side of the puck. It just doesn't happen. It's just not. There are players who take risks. They, they read a play and then something happens and they find themselves in bad spots. But just actively disregarding, I mean, we're pretty far down the track now. That just isn't happening as much. Or to the degree where you could just accuse someone of doing that, I just don't know that that's as relevant as perhaps it once was, where there was a complete disregard for defense. So I think that we have to evolve our terminology because I just don't think that that's something that's happening very often. And then if you're coaching impressionable kids how would you approach it so let's say your barometer for risk is not one that is overly tolerant for her making those reads at those and i purposely put the time of the game the score who she's playing against i put all that in there for as much context as i could because i know someone's going to say hey listen like <laughs> some of this kind of like yeah it didn't hurt us yeah she probably is not playing with like it's not she's not too like not egregious but maybe at a certain time or against a certain player she might fall on the side of more conservative so if that's the case how do you approach that like what are you saying to her how are you going to 
how are you going to continue to encourage those reads? I'm, I would argue, maybe because it's my own kid, I would argue there's a lot of elite reads in there. A lot of elite reads that don't happen in female hockey anywhere, any level, including the best we have. They have those reads. They can see it, but they don't have the same level of freedom that Ella has to be able to do it consistently for a myriad of reasons. So I'm saying she's an impressionable age, young age, has been in this bracket for quite a while. And my objective in support of in being supported by her coach is something that we are trying to foster these reads as much as possible. And sometimes she finds herself on the wrong side and sometimes, you know, she goes too quickly or she reads it too fast and gets too far ahead. That to me is the coaching part of it. And then understanding like when you use strong verbiage, like the one that I was talking about, what you run in risk, run the risk of is that the player then <clears throat> they sit too far on the defensive side. Like, is it, do we really want every player to always be on the defensive side of the puck? That's absurd. If you have every player on the defensive side of the puck, your team and that player is going to suck. They're just not going to be very good. The whole idea of being good is understanding how to read and manage those risks and run the calculations quickly in your mind, see the context of the play and be able to adhere to certain principles at certain times. Oh, wow. That to me was the context, just to give you an overview of what it is that we're, what I was trying to get to. And then at the end of this month, that community that I have is going to then talk about this at length. And we're going to go through it just the same way that we're going through it now. How do you coach this kid? What do you do? What are your thoughts? Are, do you think these are elite reads? Do you not think they're elite reads? Do you think it's appropriate? One of the things that Ella, it's when, when she talks to you, she will say, and she said it in the video that, that um, we were talking about before where she goes through with Wally and he's asking her questions and she's articulating her thoughts in the ship. There are times that she says, I believe in my skating. I trust my skating. So she feels like she has a little more of a buffer or a window because of time. So those are all factors to weigh into how you coach that kid, how she thinks, what her assets are, how, what's her recoverability, you know, what's the time in the game. So I, I'm of the opinion and why I put these things out there to my community and then now to your community and now it'll go wherever is to just raise these questions of like, we want offense and we want kids to play and learn to read the game offensively. And particularly in the women's game where not a lot of them are reading. And I don't know. I don't know if we've sucked it out of them. And I want to find different ways to raise the issue and say, okay, if we want offense, maybe there's a way in which we can coach them different. And I can assure you, perhaps taking a look at some of these, like, really, in a, I don't know the word for it, but, like, the verbiage that we use is really important. And I'm a big vocabulary guy. I think the words you use is really important and how you phrase it. It's not often what you say, it's how you say it. The tone, the... The, the 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 connotations that surround the phrasing in which you use for a lot of players and i'm going to say not non-gender the way in which you say it and the verb you use the connotation that surrounds the ver that verbiage to you might be you know something like well you're cheating you know you hear you're cheating the game and you're trying to use a verbiage that's strong to get them to make better decisions when in fact you could throw them in a turtle shell and then they just don't make those reads at all. Like in our, in that league, PWHL is the top junior league in Canada. There are kids that will not pass the puck in front of their own net. They will not do it for any, and, and the, there's nobody there. There's not a threat anywhere. 
Their, their team could be on a line change. They will go around the net. They will not pass it in front of their own net within 20, 25 feet of the net. It won't happen. Well, why is that? Is that because this kid doesn't read the game very well? Is that because the kid doesn't see the pass? Is that because they are just so risk adverse that maybe they got the puck turned over and now they're just like, there is no way I'm putting myself in that situation? No, I think it's something that was said to them early on in their life as a rule or a phrase to say, never, ever pass the puck in front of your own net. Don't do it. So now we're at a level where these kids can play. There's a lot of really good players in the league. There are kids in that league who are going to play Division I hockey who will not pass the puck under any circumstance in front of their own net. I think it's absurd. I think it's ridiculous. But this, so it, it, and I, so my immediate phrasing is well, why are they doing that? What is going on that causes them to do it? These are good hockey players, really good, smart players that in this particular area, regardless of the circumstances, I'm not talking about F1 and F2 in the passing lane. They're trying to sauce a puck over. I'm talking nobody's there and they won't do it. That to me is interesting. We're, uh, that's an, a read that's been eliminated. How do we put that back in? How do we encourage these sorts of things? And I'm not saying everyone needs to do it the way I'm doing it. I'm just raising the question. I'm just raising the question. And I want to see if we can create dialogue around, we want to have offense, but sometimes we use phrasing in like the one that I picked because I thought it was a good one because we hear it all the time and people use it at every age level. What is the impact of that? And is it as long lasting as the one that I just described? And if it is, can we find a way to evolve and still not have kids be completely on the wrong side of the puck all the time and be putting their team at really bad situations, which I don't know how much that's really happening. And that's why I want to illustrate those clips with Ella, because there's times in which, you know, she's moving and doing certain things, but I like how much risk was the team really under at any given time? I would argue none hard. If there was, it was really small, if not any. And so if that's the case, then could or should we be encouraging that? And then the other point, the last one I'll have in this diatribe here of the context behind what it was that I was trying to do and what I'm what I am trying to do as part of this community that I'm trying to foster this type of thought is. As we go through this with these kids and we're working on working on their ability to to read the game and, and see the game and we want them to understand, you know, where they need to be in relationship to the puck at a given time. You're either going to be above the puck or on the offensive side. You're going to be on the defensive side or you're going to be neutral. You're waiting or anticipating and you're trying to put yourself in a neutral position so that you could go either or depending on what happens next. How many of our kids read the game that way? Should they read the game that way? How many of them even consider what position that they're actually in at a given time in relationship to where the puck is? And if we were to teach it in that way, what impact might that have on their ability to decision? And when we ask them a question and say, hey, what were you thinking? You were on the offensive side of the puck there. What were you thinking? Well, I saw X. Or why were you in a neutral position there? Well, it's because. So you you create the question based on the positioning of the puck and their position and then the context of the play. And all those becomes considerations that allow them to make better decisions based on the situation going forward, which may foster more offensive thinking that's responsible as it relates to team play. That's what the context is. So hopefully as I go through this, I wanted to kind of lay it out so everyone knew what it was I'm really trying to do um, as, and what, who, this, who this video was for and, the and all that was. And then Wally's part of my, part of my, uh, part of my cult, 
And so he uh, he saw this whole situation. He was like, oh, my God, like this is something that we should share. He asked me and I said, yes, but I was concerned about context because everyone's going to see the video. They read the video. Not everyone's going to read the article. And then you could read the article and not watch the video. And I really think you need to do both. So I was a little worried about that. So that's why I've gone the extra mile here in this call to really explain the context of what I'm after, what the purpose of it is, who the population is I'm speaking to, and what I'm trying to do and what types of things, what types of conversations I'm trying to elicit. So on the heels of that, we have some hands up. I'd be happy to 